Hi, I'm Sebastian Reynolds, UK-based composer, producer, music maker and publicist. I'm launching a podcast because I want to create opportunities to explore problems, ideas or situations from as many different angles and perspectives as possible. To honestly examine personal experience in light of the views of experts in any given field. In the pursuit of truth, some of the hardest obstacles to overcome are one's personal biases and the innate urge to rationalise away counter arguments or ideas that cause one cognitive dissonance. I hope that this podcast will help me to keep open-minded and to learn and grow. For future podcasts, I'm looking forward to speaking to friends, acquaintances and colleagues from the music world, as well as scientists, academics and experts from a range of disciplines that I have a personal or professional interest in, including, but not limited to, Buddhism, athletics, health and well-being and far beyond. For this first podcast, I spoke to my good friend Simon McCorry. Simon is a composer, cellist and producer and I've had the good fortune to collaborate with him musically as well as to run his press and PR campaigns. Simon's latest EP, Nature in Nature, is out now on C Blue Audio. As we might come on to talk about, there's this uh, sort of idea that I'm really interested in around novelty and newness and innovation and then like... um, I mean, if you, because we talked about that a bit before, but so it's just this idea I have that, well, it's just what's objectively the case is that pre 20th century, sort of a lot of things moved very slowly, including arts and literature and culture, like all these movements that happened, happened over the course of long periods, relatively longer periods of time. And so, and with music, you know, people would live and die listening to more or less the same kinds of music and the same kinds of music that their father and their grandfather or grandmother or like their previous generations have been listening to. And obviously within, you know, there were these sort of landmark shifts and particularly related often to technological developments like the invention of the piano from the harpsichord. But... Yeah, the pre twentieth century it did move slowly and then suddenly bang, like all those sort of big technological innovations and just these spawned these incredible kind of you think of dance music, like electronic dance music and like the just the sort of cacophony of genres and subgenres and sort of it's just it's, and and there's such a like Yeah. I what Oh no, sorry. Uh, that's how. <laughs> see, there's the the, the Zoom um, uh, delay. I I I think there's. I mean, there's a kind of thing. I remember learning in philosophy when look, especially in looking at science. That it's a thing from whatever point in history you're in. It always looks that things have been more rapid more recently, because we see more details of what's close to us, and we see less details of what's further away. Just like. With our vision, you know, something right up here, we see in more detail than what's maybe 10 metres away and certainly more than 100 metres away and certainly more than a kilometre away. So there's this. Also, I suppose within historical contexts, um, the historical record becomes sparser the further back you go in time. Not because people kept less records. Yes, there are less people, etc., etc. But data is lost. Um, whether that's different now because of the way things are digitized, but I think it's really hard to judge things on the level of where we are now or the level of the last 20, 30 years where you do have the internet and things are stored in records on computers. Um, you know, I remember people going, yeah, the CD is like, it's just going to last forever. Uh, it's going to get a C out vinyl. CDs are one of the worst ways of keeping things. Old tapes actually survive better. So there is a danger. I remember hearing um, a couple of, um, I can't remember, historians talking about digital record going, well, actually, if there's a power failure or there's an electromagnetic impulse from a nuclear war, it just all gets wiped. So we don't know. I mean, okay, they're far, maybe they're far-fetched examples, but thinking about the historical record and how we look at it, I th- if it, of course, we feel like there's a sense of things being more rapid, but I have a, had, I mean, I had a thing like when working as a 
you know, sound design, I mean, so my sound design I had when I'm in theatre, where I've been asked to research music of a period and uh, come up with some suggestions to the director of the music we can use in a play. And it always fascinates me some how rapidly things change. I was doing some recently music in the 20s and there there was a big change from the 20, the early 20s in British dance music um, in the bands through to the early 30s through to the 30s. Very, very big shifts of style. I mean, the 20s, you, you have the Charleston and the Foxtrot and things like this, but towards, and a thing which they called hot dance music, or I think that's the right term, which basically kind of... Um, kind of whitewashed if you like uh, jazz um and then it, and then then it changed in the early 30s you started and why that was i don't know but you you would get different styles of music the slowly the big band thing started coming along became a bit more raucous i mean obviously the tail of the 30s 30s you start getting you know, um other kinds of dance music which is faster moving uh, depending on how we're listening to it I probably in one, you know, not knowing lots about that period, I probably listened to all that 20s and 30s music and go, it all sounds a bit similar. But that could be exactly the same as someone's listening to 90s, uh, you know, various variations of trance to uh, later 90s hip hop to what's going on in the, went on in the 2000s or noughties or however you call them. So I don't know. I think it's really hard for us to judge. Um, definitely, you're, I think technology has a massive impact on um, what we do with music as as producers and producers and makers of music, um, you know, and the, you know the shift of being able to re shift from having to use a sa sampler to actually being able to do it on a, on a laptop or a computer it, um, was massive. Uh, I mean, and now there's ways of you know, online pieces of software for creating music, even online synthesizers and things like that. I mean, that's opens up availability of technology, which I guess, you know, the old TB303s of the time were cheap baseline machines, but they be open in their time, their costs go for ridiculous money now, but they were cheap technology, which most people could get hold of and start making things with synthesizers, which didn't ha exist in the 70s. So, you know, like the, you know, the roller drum machines are, <laughs> you know, they they weren't expensive in their time. Now they're sought after pieces of equipment. But I know I get um, your point. I think one of the one of the main points there for me is the lack of um, archive and how it's one from the materials that have survived from the last, like, let's say 500 years, six, 700 years of music making even a thousand years that it would appear from the outside that the shifts are relatively gradual compared to what happened with the 10 20th century and that clearly there were some profound transformative changes that happened with technological advancements and it's interesting the point you make about how you know we don't know we have this idea that this body of recording that we have now is going to last in perpetuity and there's no reason to believe that at all there's plenty of reasons why everything could be lost but I suppose it's for me one thing I'm thinking about in a way is the sort of more about an attitudinal thing so we we've sort of and I but the thing is even that might not be a new thing you know that I, I I'm sort of saying I'm sort of trying to say in a way that it's it's so much a sort of neurosis. This is projecting as well, because I suppose this is just me personally as an artist and a music maker. Like there's always that, the sort of insecurities and that those thoughts of like, what makes me special? And like, am I, am I innovative enough? Am I different enough? Am I, because I really, there's nothing worse than hearing stuff that's so obviously sort of, derivative and lacking creativity and imagination but I suppose I'm trying to counter that thought with this other idea that well maybe we've become sort of excessively fixated or maybe I just personally have become sort of excessively fixated with ideas of sort of 
newness and innovation that are more to do with technology and less to do with just making like creativity and expression and there's one other point I wanted to make as well which I was thinking of is thinking about technology and restrictions on creativity because of a lack of technology well I suppose you could say like if you take the human voice and use of language as like the most sort of fundamental technology and form of expression that we have it just occurred to me I was reading Anthony Burgess's biography um, by Andrew Biswell and it's sort of point he Biswell pointed out that as an aside in Manchester it's probably less the case now things have been a little bit sort of bleached out but Certainly when Burgess was growing up, I guess in the like, when was he born? Maybe 1910, something around then. But like that early part of the 20th century in Manchester, they could tell where you were from down to the street in some cases from your accent. Wow. Yeah. So there was something about this sort of like, and obviously it's a lot to do with culture and identity and so on, but there's also something about like, and obviously folk music must have been incredibly nebulous and very regionally specific, regional, region specific rather. Yes, I think that's right with specific songs or specific stories. Um, yeah, I think that's, that, that's fascinating. Whereas now our, our voices do become more homogenised. Though, yeah, I mean, of course, there's still some regional differences, but they're not they're not as acute um, as you're describing. Y yeah, they're they're not quite as as specific. Although things are always mixing and merging, and new things are evolving out of that. And it's interesting because in in U the UK, we I think being you sort of excuse me UK based, you sort of think. Um, uh, fizzy water. There's a bad idea having fizzy water whilst doing a podcast. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe got we should some all rookie mistakes maybe going we should, on. Here. Maybe we should all. I think like kind of yeah, burp together. I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have actually in in the UK compared to much larger countries. I'm led to believe, I was told, I'd need to double check with uh, someone but uh, who knows about these things, but apparently in Russia, the sort of regional dialects and um, regional accents are really minimal. Like there's a bit of a difference between Moscow and Petersburg, but considering the huge scale of the country, there's relatively little difference. Whereas if you think in the UK... You know, it has been homogenised and sort of blended out to an extent, but there is still a lot of yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah. strong variation in, in accents, considering uh, the size of the country. East London, East London, North London, <laughs> sorry, East London, North London, um, West London, South London, but they're all different, South East London. Uh, yes, yeah, true. Uh, though interestingly, I, like my 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 sister um moved to italy many years ago and she lives in a village in liguria and they have dialects per village i mean the dialect for uh, um a couple of generations before would become before italian and the dialect from village to village is different uh we're talking like villages which are like less than a couple of miles between each other which is extraordinary i mean she lives in a village called pina and there's a village called castel vittorio and they had very different <laughs> they had different dialects but um which is a fascinating thing as well I, but thinking going back to your point about the human voice i thought this was kind of interesting what you were saying about the human voice being our most immediate technology and i was always been really impressed by when working in schools with young people is one of the things a lot of people are able to do is beatbox and you know they can do that and create music without an instrument without any technology and i that's it's something from hip-hop culture which has become ubiquitous amongst young people you know that and uh, spoken word as ways of expressing expressing and um that i mean sort of thinking about going back we're talking about the big technology electronics whatever and then you sort of than this so maybe maybe that's enabled by the phone and youtube i don't know you know how how is that you know, 
people learn things, mm. learn things from each other, which is. But yeah, no, yeah, I, I would. I'd like to go back and sort of pick up again this, the point about the sort of gluttony for innovation and sort of innovation for innovation's sake. Because you felt like for me is something I always harp on about is the my sort of one of my favorite movements in music, the sort of post twentieth century, uh, post twenty, post Second World War, um, sort of European classical movement. So like Stockhausen, Zanakis, Messian, etc., and the like. I feel like for them there was this well for the movement there was this convergence of new technology like a lot of this sort of new audio technology which hadn't really it was a lot of it was developed during the war wasn't it as i'm sure you know about and then there was the sort of like a lot of them well most of them were sort of directly involved in the war stockhausen was a medic in the german army messian was a prisoner of war um and and so on and and the, the, you had this sort of perfect storm of technical advancements and people that had something to say with it so they weren't just sort of using the technology for the sake of itself they actually had something they really deep they wanted to sort of express and, and in a way catharsize but i don't know what you think about that yeah and i think there's a just dis- i think i mean i think that's fascinating as well i mean that's a big shift because i, I mean i th- and i think the shift is reflected also the little I know and little I learnt about in literature uh, as well, even though it's less to do with the technology there, but there's this thing about fragmentation, this thing about the horrors of this worldwide war, and it was worldwide because it involved not just European nations and the horror of that and the horror of the Holocaust uh, and not being able to really, you know, that massive moral hole of that great human loss and not being able to come to terms with it is is the rational world order had become fragmented and destroyed. And I think this, you know, there is, you know, that Adorno thing, you know, it's like lyrical poetry is dead. Um, That idea of anything romantic and grand almost everything became smaller i mean what well, some of my favorite pieces of music for cello are these um is a serenade for solo cello by hans werner henze and they i think i have a feeling it's on the end of the 40s but they're like for me listening to first when i first heard them they're fragmented they're using the serial 12 tone techniques they're very short they're 30 to 40 seconds long and they like come from silence and go into silence and they're not grand in any way um they're like a shattered mirror in a way. I mean, and but with not, without being maudlin in any way there. Uh, so I think that uh, with what you're saying, combined with technology, but combined with the thing to say, combining with this shift of the break of old orders, um, because that's so much tied, the, the kind of, you know, the rationalism and the science, the rationalism of... <laughs> or the pseudo-rationalism of national socialism and the, uh, and the consequences of that, the rationalism leading to the atomic bomb, the rationalism, you know, all these things which were like these beacons, this futurism of the preceding hundred years um, through the Industrial Revolution, um, in one sense of this idea of um, human beings transcending themselves some way through their science and reason thinking came to I mean, it, you know sort of within five six years it uh, well it's actually longer if you think about the kind of the trouble which was going on in europe beforehand but you know within that short period of time it was shattered it was broken and um and i think that invited this new ways of just exploring uh exploring and tearing apart um, same structures existing in music and I think the same is absolutely I mean Stockhausen famously said that he he sort of rejected um, traditional rhythms because they reminded him of the march of the Nazi jackboots um, and of, of course uh, Zanakis it's funny you mentioned science actually as well because obviously a lot of them were I think Stockhausen almost saw himself as much of an engineer and a physicist as a as a sort of 
in a traditional sense a musician or a composer and also Zanakis and quite a few of them took this in the, the Schoenberg approach you know like you just, just referred to the whole tone like 12 tone scale sort of composition method but there's something about Zanakis and and the sort of to me a kind of interesting irony about the, the movement and this you know, like you say, the sort of dysto- utopian turned dystopian sort of um, dynamic that happens with clinging on to technology and then the sort of the nightmares that unfold if you become sort of let the genie out of the bottle, like you say, with nuclear war and the splitting of the atom and so on. But it's interesting with Zanakis because he he actually composed, I think there's a piece of his, I think it's Yenta, Yunter, um where he or there was at least one of his pieces where he he wanted sort of again it's m- along the lines of the serialist technique and this sort of generative method of not following the traditional sort of conservatoire systems of composition and just trying to throw it all out and, and create a new language and and to sort of almost dehumanize in a funny sort of way is to like to think beyond emotional feelings that are expressed through like the traditional sort of scale process of composing music but the sort of there's to me there's a sort of funny irony in a way that he was borrowing on the sort of methodologies that you use if you're a scientist where you're trying to almost reject and overcome your own biases and your own tendencies like the whole idea of the scientific method is that you're controlling for your bias and trying to undermine it whereas as an artist as a sort of you're almost trying to indulge it you're trying to indulge your emotions and your feelings and find a way to communicate them but there's an irony to me or for me in the in the Stockhausen Zanakis approach where even though they might in some senses be trying to go beyond their sort of emotional feelings and and just the sort of the 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 emotions of being a human being but in fact ironically when they they're creating this music like especially like Zanakis's music is it just sounds like trauma and pain like it sounds completely human and it sounds completely sort of uh the sort of response you'd expect someone to have if they had had the experiences that he had in the second world war where he was like Um, he was in the Greek socialist party that were fighting the fascists and then he got he was in the resistance because after the war the British government sided with the right of centre party to put down the the leftists and Zanakis was blown up and left for dead on a pile of bodies and had to be rescued and then sort of smuggled out of Greece and he never went back there and he only ever came to England once as well because he never forgave them. He stayed in Paris. Um, but it's it's just it's just interesting that thing where he he was trying to sort of go beyond, but in fact he just sort of in, embodied what he'd experienced. Yeah, I think this is an interesting. I mean, this kind of shifting, I suppose we we're talking about. But I think this is interesting. I find this fascinating. Um, it's it's a funny thing. It's almost if you indulge. I mean, there's so going back many hundreds of years to classical music. What uh, the, the I mean specifically the Mozart Schubert. Well, Schubert's on the cusp, isn't he? Beethoven, Haydn, kind of thing. But what's really interesting there, and I think this relates, is that I mean, being having some kind of uh, classical training, when it's very easy when playing that music to overindulge it and then it loses its emotion. And it's almost, you just have to play the notes and the emotion comes through. And there's something similar going on here. I mean, I think as a artist myself, I mean, as a musician myself, when I try and indulge an emotion, um, it becomes quite pedestrian in a way. Whereas if I create structures and ideas, it almost, because in one sense, when I'm trying to think the emotion, well, we feel emotions, we don't think emotions. So if I'm trying to think it, it's going to be a 
weird kind of copy of it. Whereas if I ha you p use my mind to do what my mind in terms of my rational mind is good at, it is creating structures, ideas, uh, if you like, clothes hang on which to hang things on, let it be concerned with that. R then I find that the emotional bit comes through and maybe something similar is happening with what you're hearing uh, in the music of Xenicus. And it, but he's focusing on something intellectual and rational structure, but his aesthetic choice is choosing what's working and what isn't. And his aesthetic choice is not, it can never, I mean, it does actually make philosophical sense for aesthetic. It doesn't, it can't have any first a prioristic principles from which to grow from it. It's caught up within who we are in the context of who we are as human beings. Um, and this is fascinating, I think. It's almost like you have to have to kind of focus your attention elsewhere to actually do the real thing or the thing of integrity. Uh, I think this also relates to what you were saying earlier about originality and uh, our quest, you know, it seems to be a, and I think it is, I think you're right. You put, you know, you really put your finger on something we do as modern humans, we're kind of, especially as artists, we're obsessed of being original, whatever that means. Um, and therefore thinking original and innovative are the same thing. Um, maybe they're not. Maybe being original is being oneself and being oneself is the thing you're talking about. Yeah, and I, I suppose that would be going back to that point again, this idea of like, you know, how much sort of innovation has really happened in the 20th century, I suppose, like, that's the question. And like, is it, are we so close to it that we can see all of this sort of micro detail, whereas at a macro level, if you look back in 100 years, it, but I, I still feel like, you can't deny that the technologies that we've had at our disposal, especially since after the war, and as much an attitudinal shift as well as like a sort of technological shift, but that there has been this kind of potentiality for for exploration and that, that we just haven't had before. So. I think that's true, and though I think I think that's true, technology and obviously technology has a major part but I think also well, my feeling is looking back there'll be a few major events which really define music and it and I think in lots of ways this you know the the period of these massive wars in the 20th century are one of them and they've had a lots of effects one on technology and one on the fragmentation of music um, the kind of ripping up of old structures also um, it's it's kind of democratised music, not just between, um, you know, socio-economic groups, but also between cultures. I think there's, there's been, through that, there's been a massive influence through, you know, African-American and therefore the African diaspora on, on all music, which is a massive influence. And then, obviously, influences elsewhere in the world. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking... You know, my dad was born in terms of, in terms of Indian influence um, on on music and modern music and contemporary music, contemporary pop music. I think that is another part of a shake up. Though I think we'll look up, we'll look at this period, and that would be one of the major shifts was this kind of this this uh, latter part of the twentieth century. Uh, maybe a, another one will be. Maybe will be the internet uh, on a similar similar way. Probably. I mean, I don't know, but maybe more so than any individual recording technology. Um, I think recording on itself, being able to record in a big, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, that was a massive uh, shift. And I think that worked its way out. Obviously, it's, work, it's still working its way out now. You know, the, the facts... The, I mean, I know as an art, again, and you're going to have the same, the different attitude you have towards recording as you do towards, we do towards performing live and the tension between that. Um, you know, the shift from having to write music and chord charts to uh, just recording ideas. This is very different. Yeah, and it's also that, sorry, there's just a thought that's coming to me is this point about, globalism and the sort of global village and the sort of utopian sort of aspects of it and then obviously 
digital technology, internet technology, and so on is absolutely essential for making that a reality and the fact that you can record and share. And then go and sort of at your fingertips experience, you know, because I, I, you know, there's certainly like with these sort of major digital platforms, like there's certainly dystopian and utopian perspectives on them. Like on the one hand, you can, we can all talk for a long time about how predatory and mercenary YouTube and Spotify and so on are in terms of their sort of financial modeling for for the artist side but then from the user's side and for culture as a whole they're phenomenal they're like uh, unbelievably powerful and and so many positives to it as well and then there's an argument that like it's a, it's a smaller side that I don't want to get too drawn into because there's a bigger point I want to address but just this thing of like you could say that um you know with something like Spotify or YouTube it's a brilliant service. It's absolutely amazing in so many ways. And th unfortunately, the sort of people that are going to do that sort of thing aren't doing it for charity, you know. They're doing it for profit. And unfortunately, like, the, <laughs> the sort of inevitable consequence of that is a sort of thread of exploitation, which is just sort of woven into it. Maybe that sounds a little bit almost, like, fatalistic in a sense, but I think I it's... Think I mean, I think I think you're right on all points there. I mean, I think uh, you know, the, uh, without doubt, YouTube is in a, a massive resource. I think, in terms, and, and I think you're right in terms of under the current climate. I mean, we live in a we live in that period of consumerism, but it, that it's going to be it's going to be created by someone who can make money out of it. But I think it also brings another thing is that you know the kind of I don't know the the kind of belief that the market knows best. This is one of the cases where it shows it isn't, and it shows it's really important to have pressure groups like PRS, like the Musicians' Union, leaning on government to change the rules about how the, the money is distributed and what's a fair way of that to do. Uh, and then that's completely valid as well. And that's why these, you know, these balances of power are very important. So, yeah, I think t you're right. You're, you're right. Um, yeah, you need to have checks and balances. No, no intrinsic, intrinsically... Intrinsically, uh, there's nothing. There's the, the, the there's nothing wrong with say something like YouTube. It's an amazing resource. You know, this, this kind of sweeping up of the of the weird, wonderful, and bizarre and crap. I mean, quite frankly. But I mean, it's like oh, in all periods, you know, there's always just <laughs> there's just like kind of rubble left behind. But it's you know, you can go and find out how to do anything. You can you know teach yourself how to I mean I use it for imp improving technique and something I can't access a another professional for so you know many many things and as well as just looking for archive stuff someone's put their 78 records on which you can't find on any other service you know they've kind of have them playing on their old gramophones yeah I mean it's amazing this access to information I think it's very good um yeah pluses and minuses what? What do you think? I took. Yeah, of course. I mean, talking about um, trying to understand the sort of as we set up as a theme, like talking about newness and innovation mm. and how we relate to it, and how you know is our sort of current situation as artists in a way sort of consistent with history, or is it is it more or less different than it feels? So there's another point I'd like to get into as as we're both sort of in the sort of emerging artists bracket and the idea of like wanting to make it, wanting to be successful, wanting to have an income, wanting to have that sort of renown, like being aspirational and in ambitious and not, not to denigrate that or to see that as something that's negative, but to celebrate that, but also to see it in a sort of historical context. So like... You know, we've developed, there's this whole sort of cultural trope that's developed, like when I was a teenager, like this whole idea of playing in a band and sending demo tapes off and trying to get signed and trying to get a record deal. I was like sort of in this hangover from the 90s in a way. I just sort of missed the golden age when they were doling out money left and right. And so, you know, I had a much harder time of it in the 
noughties and so on, trying to get advances and whatever from record labels. And I just like the whole thing of aspiration as an artist and, and that we sort of have this idea now and, and it feels to me like a modern thing and I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but, you know, I don't know what pre 20th century the path would have been if you wanted to play music or like most, you know, cause all the houses had pianos in or, you know, people would, everyone would sing music and play music. It's just that there would be a, a sort of relatively small minority of, people would actually go to the conservatoire, train as a composer, and then from there end up being successful and then end up sort of solidifying their reputation to the point where we're still talking about them now. Um, and, you know, so many of the, the great composers, the very greatest, Mozart and so on, died impoverished. I mean, they had renown, but they died in poverty, essentially. So it's like we have this this idea of like the aspiring artist and it's so unfair that I'm not famous sort of thing. But it's like, how does that relate to the history? Like music's already been done and now we're in a situation where you can record music at home to a really high standard. Like if you have the talent, you can basically make release quality Absolutely, professional yeah. music that will stand up on radio and so yeah. on. And you can distribute it as well. Yeah. So, but there's this thing of like, we, we want to go that extra step and try and reach a wider audience. I think it's a, I mean, it's a quite, a thing it's, I suppose I've struggled with over the years. I mean, I'm kind of in a fortunate position that I've made a living um, do, creating music and for theatre and other, other, you know, other live performances rather than music for music's sake, which is a really fortunate thing to have fallen into um and you know and through that you know got into library music in terms of my own art in terms of the ambition of it's not i suppose i suppose i've come to terms with it's not about fame per se i want people to hear what i'm doing i don't want to be i i believe i mean it's maybe it's arrogant or maybe it's a, a, a self-important but I have this gnarling feeling that what I do is worthwhile and people, if they get a chance to hear it, will get something from it. And I want to be able to give that. So I want that to be, I want that to get as far as possible to those ears, which wouldn't normally just listen to, you know, little old me, because, you know, I was a person, I'm not going to say that much of an interesting person, but I think, I think I have something more interesting to offer us in terms of music, and that's my gift to give to other people. And I think there, there, there was the turnaround for me. Is it's not about in one sense, it's not totally about me. It is also about what what I have to give. And that was and kind of that was um, it was actually a friend I have to thank for that who who um, kind of told me off for not doing that, and that it was important to take responsibility for that. Um, it's a really I th hard I think, thing. It's a hard I thing. I think one of the... It's a really hard thing. It's a hard thing. Yeah, I, th I think one of the, like, whatever sort of vocation one has, like, or, you know, job, profession, hobby, whatever gets you out of bed in the morning and makes things seem like that bit more bearable, I think there's, there's certainly a question as to, like, whether you're the most famous artist in the world or you're just some guy in your bedroom. I think the question ultimately is, would you be doing it anyway, regardless of whether you're successful or unsuccessful? And like, that's the million dollar question. Like, are you doing it because you basically have to do it? And for me, like, I've done music my whole life and I, I there are other things that I I love as much, you know, I love this taking an interest in Buddhism and meditation and teaching meditation. And I love running. I do love running and athletics as much as I love music. And I'm, I feel like I'm sort of tremendously fortunate to have not one, because a lot of people don't have any passions and they're just miserable. They don't have any meaning in their lives because they don't have anything that gives them meaning of fulfillment and I have three off the bat yeah. and and not only that but it's basically my career is working in it 
So it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is a full, it is, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I sort of feel doubly kind of blessed, really. Yeah, and there is a, there, yeah, and there is a side of that, and I think, well, part of this, I suppose, is like, what does we both, uh, what we have as, um, I suppose, advice to you. In, in in terms of younger generations that other people are trying this i mean i think if you're already trying to be a musician you're you've got one of those things in place like you've just said it's like you're you've got something which gives you meaning in your life i mean how good is that um and then it's about this thing about the question the question about ambition what does it really mean you know what is it like i think like you said is again is right right on it is are you doing it to be famous or are you doing it because you have to? What is your desire here? Because um, in the end, it doesn't really matter what that desire is. If your desire is to be famous, fine, that's cool. Yeah, and but I think there's also, again, to think in terms of a historical context, and we talked about this before briefly, but the idea that like pre-recorded music... Um, very like a you know probably you can sort of work out as far as i understand it. i think we talked about it before maybe you can remind me that you know it's you can sort of guesstimate how many people heard beethoven's music during his lifetime and it's a surprisingly small number of people compared to like stats on streaming services for like a mid-level artist yeah, of course. Though, I mean, I don't know if, again, this is anecdotal, 30,000 people did turn up to Beethoven's funeral. I mean, something in thousands turned up to his funeral. He was a big figure. Um, probably the first, I guess, some people say the first romantic artist, the first artist, musician as individual. But yeah, absolutely. But yeah, absolutely. And he, you know, he had to do, in his own way, he had to be his own impresario, do his own gigs, perform his own gigs, conduct his own gigs, uh, organise them, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, was a jobbing, working composer and had to get commissions for his symphonies. You know, they weren't, he was sort of beyond the age of courtly music then. Uh, the, the, another massive change the, the the shattering of the of European court through the period of Napoleon it created a massive shift but yeah I mean I think he also the, you, we sort of like the mention of conservatoire composers I mean of course you know someone like Beethoven and Mozart weren't conservatoire composers because there wasn't such a thing as a conservatoire um, and the Especially beforehand, my my inkling is that music was a vocation, really, really vocational, not in that sense academic. I mean, I think there's important correspondence throughout. Um, if we're talking about Western classical music throughout Europe between composers and and musicians, but I think outside of the sphere of them, they they weren't important people. Um, they were servants, um, literally, whether of of a of a aristocrat or church or the court. Um, then you've got a whole other level of music, haven't you? I mean, you've got folk music, um, and that's a whole thing in itself. I mean, those mu those musicians travel also travelled a lot, you know, travel between cultures. I mean, that's a. I mean, I think there's a theory. It's not really. A, special, a thing I know a lot about, but about the troubadours and the travelling through, you know, uh, kind of the Islamic, e uh, no, kind of Eastern Mediterranean, um, and the influence of Islamic music on on European folk music, uh, and then indirectly into Elizabethan, I was thinking about in the UK, uh, Elizabethan music through the music of John Dowland. So it, it, it's... it's, it's, it's I don't know, again, this boundary between what is high art and low art. I wonder, again, it's about written record more than actuality, that there's a division scene. I don't think the divisions really existed until the advent of the conservatory. That's an inkling, do you know what I mean? That's a guess. I and mean, the idea of the acad academization, if that, is that a word, of, of music. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's just it was a whole interesting thing. Uh, Mm, it's really interesting. interesting yeah and also so the uh, the idea and, and it, the thing is that 
I think we can sort of be prone to, like you were saying before about, I, uh, human beings are like drawn towards charismatic, beautiful people. Like whether it's now or a thousand years ago or thousands, like we've always done it. We've always deified people. We always sort of create cults of personality, whether it's the Kardashians or whether it's, you know, whoever it might be through history. That's always just something we naturally do. And inevitably that will happen with, with singers and with musicians as well in one way or another. But like you say, like certainly some of the, I mean, imagine if Mozart was alive now, how he'd be treated and how wealthy he'd be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he's, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, with his prodigal, you know, his extraordinary talent from some ridiculously young age. Uh, yeah. Also, how much would it have changed his music? I don't know. Could it have had a detrimental effect or not, you know? You know, I was just thinking like someone like a violinist, Nigel Kennedy, who, you know, was a child prodigy and, you know, incredibly uh, virtuosic violinist, both in jazz and classical. I sort of had this period where he couldn't play for a long period and went, went inwards and sort of come out of it and is doing his own thing in his own way now. But that that's interesting as well. You know, how much does, you know, the cult of personality and our, you know, ubiquitous, I probably said that word a bit too often. So it's this nice sounding word, ubiquitous, you know, a kind of widespreading kind of media and access to it. I mean, how that affects the culture, personality and how people feel about themselves. Um, how much the cult, the cult of the self overtakes from the actual self for that individual, which could be tragic, I think. Um, and tragic for the rest of us also. Yeah, I think there's it's pretty well documented and in, in, in plain to see how so many people that have become sort of very famous in their developmental years just are ruined by it and never really kind of overcome it. Uh, the damage that's done. Um, that's absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, I think as a young adult, you know, you're you're still, we're still kind of mental, I mean, we're continuously mentally growing and emotionally growing and, and the massive changes you're going through and suddenly to have this really extraordinary spotlight. Yeah, it's going to have its effect, isn't it? But yeah, I was thinking, so going back, actually thinking one of the things that I was thinking about I mean, in terms of your music, because you, you were talking about technology a lot and, um, well, two things I was I was wondering is the, the music I first heard of yours was the kind of solo collective um, and more kind of more piano orientated neoclassical, uh, whereas a lot of what you've been putting out in the last year is much more electronic and much more sample based, and quite a long way from that. Though, as I've got to know as you as a person that. Obviously, that's always been important to you, but you've obviously made a concerted choice to make a change. There's a change in the technology you're using, in a sense. Um, and then I was thinking about this track you released last year, Heartbeat, where you where it's quite immediate and it was recorded on your phone. So this is, if you like, it's lo-fi, but also quite hi-fi because you can record with your phone, <laughs> which is, you know, it's the, these devices which sort of do everything. Um, yeah. So I mean, what uh, what your thoughts about that were? Yeah, it's it's. I'm just. It's all about circumstances, I think, and how things kind of worked out. Where I've been making music. Well, I've been playing music my whole life. Almost, I started the recorder when I was four or whatever. I always wanted to do it, and then was playing piano from a young age and. And then, so from when I was a teenager, sort of mucking about in bands and recording cassette demos and doing all this sort of normal stuff. And then I was sort of playing in bands, yeah, from the age of 17, I guess. And always working with other people and always sort of being the keyboard player in the band and 
played in lots of different genres of music and I've always I'm a naturally sort of social person so I think some people that get drawn to the sort of solo artist vibe are very much lone wolves like they enjoy their own company they don't want to have to compromise with other people they just want to get on with what they're doing whereas I'm like it's a funny thing and it's always been a sort of source of mental tension for me where part of me is always you know I've always I've often led things and like come up with the ideas and formed things and so on but then I've always felt like I've had to rely on on other people and I suppose it was all that I ever knew was just collaborating with other people and you know mostly wanting to do song-based music and I can't sing <laughs> that's a problem um but then I sort of if I was yeah so so that 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 was my path and it took me a long time to realize that actually I did want to start sort of forging my own path and I during this period I had been experimenting a lot and recording a lot and working with lots of different people because similarly that I can't really sing so I couldn't do the like singer songwriter thing so I'd need to be in a band with other people who can sing and then also I didn't have my own computer set up and so I couldn't just sort of produce electronic music. I'd always muck about and I had a little sampler and stuff, but I'd never, I'd always been in a position where I was sort of at the mercy of having to work with other people in a way. And and so I, I created a lot of stuff and came up with a lot of ideas for a long time, but never really even had the idea that I could just be my own person. I could just do my own thing. And it happened that when I was starting to think in that way, I was starting to really lose heart with playing in a band and having to put up with other people that I met Anna Muller in Ber in Berlin and obviously she's a cellist and there's a piano in a flat and I had this track and I was just like I've been playing around with a few different things and I played her the track and she's like oh yeah yeah let's work on that and obviously she's you know quite a big deal and she'd worked with Neil Swam like I was aware of her reputation but she's just a nice lady and we got on well and sort of like the solo collective thing just sort of grew out of the ground that we had between the th the three of us where and I knew Alex there's a weird sort of irony in the fact that Anna and Alex grew up in the same area Berlin they'd crossed paths they maybe met briefly but they didn't know each other and they only met because of me and because of Adrienne and that's a long story but um so it's sort of the whole piano neoclassical you know, that's something I've always done and I've always been into, but it was one of like a whole range of things that I've done and been doing and been interested in for a long time. So, and I think like it probably is, you know, a bit of an issue for me as an artist is that I am just so all over the place in terms of my output. Like it's, it really is very, very eclectic. And if you go and sort of look me up on Spotify there'll be like a couple of VPs that have all this Thai influence and all this Thai music and then there's the neoclassical stuff and then there's this sort of trip hoppy stuff and the dark like ambient sort of post Stockhausen thing like I'm, I'm fully aware that I'm a mess but I quite like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, I mean, it's kind of, yeah. I mean, I I love that. I mean, I love when art, I mean, could you artists explore? Um, it's interesting what you're saying. It was like so the solo collective grew out of uh, out of. It's almost like a. It wasn't planned, and that's kind of nice. It's really nice to hear. It's sort of it's something that was an opportunity which was there through something else and grew out of that, and that that's really interesting. I think. I mean, I think. A lot of things for me have happened that way is by things fully just happening. And, you know, maybe my whole kind of journey with theatre was a bit like that. Um, however, also what's really interesting is also, it was more of a question again, it's like, so you kind of say, oh, I'm a mess. I play, do all this kind of music going from all, all these kind of genres. As a publicist, how important is it to have a more, be more unified or do you think it doesn't matter or do you think it's something which has changed in this day and age i mean i've been so i've been doing pr and been working as a publicist for 
I think I started doing it about 14 years ago, maybe something like that, something like that. And um, I feel like, you know, we could, it's probably not so worth getting too sort of caught up in the weeds in terms of a lot of detailed specifics. I think that like from the micro to the macro, there are principles that kind of hold, like whether you're as an artist, if you're just doing one release and you're looking to just get it out there as much as you can, you know, you're, you're aspirational, but realistic and like, well, let's, you know, and I always work with artists for the most part, either that I've worked with before or that approach me. Cause in my experience for the sort of thing that I do, the artist has to really want to do it. There has to be that, that wanting, that sort of aspiration, that openness. And a lot of artists are just too insecure, frankly. That's the real problem. They'll make other excuses, but actually it's just this, they're afraid of being judged. And I can completely empathise with that. Like, I think we all can, but I think that it's, for me, it's like I'm in a fortunate position where the sort of work that I do, the sort of musical promotional work, which I'm quite experienced in, is, um, you know... I'm in a position where I have a lot of repeat customers and people that I've built relationships with over the years. And I think that there are some artists who will have variance within what they do, but they're relatively, the spectrum is more narrow. And then there's others. I'm not the only one. I'm not saying I'm all that unique in a way. Like there are others that also have quite a broad spectrum, a broad spectrum of what, what they offer in terms of genres and styles and so on. But I think it's just about whether you're on narrower end or the wider end, I think it's just about quality, however you can define that <laughs> in terms of what you're doing. And authenticity as well is hugely important. So like, if and I think it's very obvious to people if you're trying to, if you're being inauthentic, like if you're trying to, take on a style of music or a form of music just because you think it's cool or just because you purely because you think other people will like it obviously there's an element of aspiration you hope that people will enjoy it but for me like my relationship to the various things that I do is fairly similar I don't feel like I have one that I'm particularly strong in or one that I have a particularly close relationship to but it all, to me, from my side, feels authentic. It feels like it's coming from a genuine place. And this is the stuff that, you know, with Anna and Alex, they're both really well known, you know, especially in Germany and especially Anna internationally. But like, it came from a very genuine place. We just got on well and enjoyed playing together. I didn't do it in a purely like sort of business driven way. And similarly with all the other stuff that I do as well, there's there's a thread of honesty and it's like, I would be playing this or making this anyway. And I, I am going to be careful and think about how it's presented. See if the, if it's like an EP or an album or whatever, that it has a sort of internal coherency that's going to make it listenable. Because I think within releases, and the way that you package and commodify music, it, it's something that it's almost like one of the most exciting aspects of music for me is because I have such a large sort of catalogue of music. You know, I've made hundreds of tunes over the years. I've got all these ideas. Like a, a part of my work day to day, my practice is sort of going through and sort of curating from my catalogue and as well as making stuff. And there is like a new EP I'm bringing out in the summer called Infancy, which was sort of, it's sort of, came out organically but there was a feeling as I was making the tracks they were sort of coalescing together and I was a bit more sort of conceptual in that way whereas a lot of the stuff is I already had some tunes and maybe I'd make one or more, two more and they'd start to see a sort of narrative through it do you know what I mean does that make sense yeah yeah no absolutely I mean and it's almost again it's, it's your aesthetic sense as an artist seems to be is what is choosing those things and seeing how those bits fit together even like from the almost like it's like a, it's using your past recordings and ideas as a, as raw material to which to collage from uh, which is kind of interesting but in some sense that's I guess that's the same as putting the 
the CD or the album or the EP together and the themes within that. Um, it's the, I mean, I kind of find a similar thing is that themes suggest themselves rather than, you know, I'm, I know, you know, I'm not, yeah, I work creating commissioned music for theatre and stuff, so therefore it's got a theme. But when it comes down to my own work, it's like, it, I, I do not think in that way. Uh, I have I have things which are going around my head over and over again in terms of ideas, philosophical concepts, or just ways I want to make music, and you know, it's the, the then the themes, the themes of the stories, kind of suggest themselves in the way that music suggests itself. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I can't sit down and go, okay, I'm going to do an album about. I'm always very, um, when I see, uh, I mean, some people can do that and they can do it really, really well, but there's quite often you get people who claim that and it's really, if, if I think it, if it lacks authenticity. Maybe the music's got authenticity, but the linkage of the theme and the, the, they, they feel like it's, it's ticking a box or it's you know it's like filling in an arts council application or <laughs> something like that but it's it's uh i think it's really difficult i think it's a really difficult um i, I, I think be... there's there's something i'm quite excited to mention um i should mention so i got this pair of eps that i released on faith and industry records on my friend christian's label uh, the Universe Remembers, which came out in May 2020, and then this new one, Nihilism is Pointless, is coming out on the 29th of January 2021. So, and I sort of, it, it's a lot of tunes and material that's just sort of, I've had sat round or has been in some sort of form, and it's sort of all really organically evolved. But then it, you come to this point where, like, one EP sort of presents itself where he's like, yes, these four tracks actually they work well together and I'm going to finish them off. And I think, and then the second EP, and now they still see them as a pair, as two sides of a coin. Um, and it's, it's sort of really hard to, I think it's really quite hard to explain this sort of process to someone who doesn't do it themselves, who's not a music maker or an artist. Um, and this, I saw, ah, oh, what was it? There's a lot of people like Andy Warhol, said about how he enjoyed being bored and about how important sort of space and silence and quiet is for creativity. And we were listening to someone the other night. It could have even been last night. Oh, it's David Lynch was talking about how ideas come. And he was saying that like the bigger the idea, it's like, a, it's like you're fishing. And that in order to get those real like big fish from the deep the, the the bigger the fish you want to catch the deep the, the more quiet you need to be i really like that a lot i would like i would like to i mean it's a really good analogy from david lynch about the fishing thing and being quiet and still or being bored i i can find it's like listening is really for me is really we I mean, not in term, not just in the terms of as being a musician is to listen to what's going on and react to the material and react to the physicality of it but it's also this again this thing of quietness and letting things emerge uh again this thing about the intellect i don't think intellect is creative i think the intellect is incredibly good at solving problems it's incredibly good at creating structures it's incredibly good at finding out where things have gone wrong but it doesn't originate anything. Whereas being still, listening and waiting does. Being responsive, being responsive to the to the, the world, I mean, whether it's to one's unconscious, the subconscious, or just the world around us. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think, and because and you had a track, a really beautiful track called The Nothing That Is, and you often sort of have referred to like, the void and and sort of we've talked about space and the universe and all these things before and it's, yeah. it's certainly and and i don't know if you want to mention I, I need to wrap it up shortly but whether we we close you want to talk about your new ep that's coming out and and how the composition of it relates to what we've talked about the, I mean, the title track nature nature i suppose is the one which is kind of different from the other three which are since but 
there's always the same attitude, even though the game and styles may be different. That was, I mean, it was a commission. It was a commission for um, a dance artist, choreographer uh, from Japan, Satoko Fukuda. And she she was working with, um, wanted to create this film called, where she would dance in nature, but not as a human, but as another element of nature, that humans are also natural. And it kind it, well, I kind of took a d different route. I kind of constructed out of bits of junk and cello recorded through dictaphone, thinking about reclaimed, nature reclaiming things, or th uh, things which are human, sort of becoming reclaimed by nature, becoming part of nature. They've always been part of nature. Uh, and I suppose what's running through the, all those tracks uh, is, and I think, to be honest, a lot of the music I make now is this, is this theme of, I throw things together. I mean, they, at the moment, I, I just record and record and record and improvise and improvise and improvise and collage. Kind of what you were saying about listening back over material. Some could be very old. Though actually, this EP material is quite recent. It's all, all, all from the autumn. But it, it's, it's all about listening in a sense, and being responsive. So it's sort of going back to that theme of um, removing my intellect from it, but allowing my aesthetic sense to guide it. Uh, so, so, hence why it's still nature and nature, in a sense, going back to um, Satoko's film, is that, you know, I'm not something separate, you know, and from nature, and so, and in some, and some in some sense the kind of the eye which is engaging with this musical material assembling it is just another element in, in that um again it's one of those things can one talk about can i to speak make sense out of it rather than that's why we make music i suppose i always think a Man, man quote is if if i could if i could tell you what this song's about i wouldn't need to sing it or, or something like that but yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Dan dan dancing about architecture. Uh you remember that is that Lester Bangs? I wouldn't know it. The quote about um uh, writing about music okay. is like dancing about architecture. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I didn't know that's where it was from, but that's a really lovely image. I think it's Bangs. I think it's him. Or Hunter S. Thompson, one of those. I think it's Lester Bangs, but we need to check that. We'll have to fact check that. I um uh, I think for me, like, as I've said, I'm very into meditation, breathing, mindfulness type stuff. And then also um, running and long distance running and in high intensity training. And um, more recently, kind of getting really into cold water, cold baths, cold showers, swimming in the sea and all that stuff and also fasting. So... I'm just in three minutes' time coming to the end of my 24-hour fast. Whoa, okay. Um, so I, over Christmas, I actually went 41 hours, which I set myself a new record. But, but with water or without water? With water and the odd coffee, I have okay. to say. Oh. Okay, yeah. That's, Black coffee, okay. though, zero calories, so you're not breaking the fast. <laughs> I'm too much of a coffee junkie to. to is that to fade it. off? Is that to fade off the hunger or something? I have done that. I have, I have done something similar actually. Usually, this I mean, it's a good time of year for that. For that focus inwards. You know, it is an inward time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Me and my 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 then partner, my now wife, we we used to do that over Christmas for three or that period of new. Sorry, actually, New Year for three days. Um, I do remember we used to because we used to live on a cottage on this farm and the f and they had a, they had an orchard and um, we'd get like this apple juice from them in, in the autumn and they'd kind of harvest the apples and we'd have this frozen and we'd have this three day fast we, again with water but no other, nothing else uh, where we opened that apple juice it was just like <laughs> we're just sugar junkies you know it was just kind of very funny and it would make us high as a kite as well just on yeah three, I bet. <laughs> three days fasting. <laughs> yeah that's amazing three days funny. yeah like i say i did um recently i did 41 hours so it's like dinner on the monday nothing on the tuesday and then wednesday lunch so i'd break it on like 
afternoon or late, wherever, on the Wednesday. So, yeah, thank you very much. It's nice to chat. <laughs>